All right, we are here with Fazl Salahuddin, who is a uh, ACLU board member, as well as a uh, very accomplished lawyer, uh, Reuters super lawyer list he has made several times, uh, as well as criminal defense attorney and a civil rights litigator. Fazl, thank you so, so much for joining us here. We really appreciate it. Dave, thank you so much. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here, especially with the other guests that you have. Um, I'm the one who's just very grateful for this opportunity. Thank you. Absolutely. And I understand you are actually uh, one of two guests uh, that we've spoken to today who, in addition to a career in law, you also come from a background of playing music. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, Up until age 28, I'm 44 now. So up until I was 28, I was Uh, I think a dedicated percussionist. I've been to Guinea, West Africa, maybe eight or nine times. I had an apartment there that I kept for about five years, running a West African drum and dance company. Um, And then around age 28, one becomes a little more woke. And I started to learn about um, cultural appropriation. And honestly, it became an ill-fitting hat to be a Pakistani American running a West African drum and dance company. And at the same time, uh, I became more aware of the abuse that my friends who were mostly black were suffering in New York City um, at the hands of the police. And I was being asked all the time, oh, can you help? Can't you help? And I really couldn't. Uh, All I knew was arts, arts management and grant writing. And so some of that all came together to form the, the impetus for the transition around 2004, 2005. Since 2005, I've been dedicated to dedicating my life to helping poor people who are being abused by the system, in particular, the police, um, prosecutors, the FBI. Uh, For the most part, I've been doing work fighting the police, constitutional law, specifically focused on civil rights, helping people protect themselves. And one thing... um, that a lot of people know intuitively, but maybe it's not on the conscious uh, level, is that doing work in the justice system is a is a after the fact thing. You know, when I get involved, the police have already done what they've done. It's like, okay, here's what happened. What can we do to fix the scenario? But with federal litigation, we get to take it one step further, which is to say, what can we do to make sure this doesn't happen again? Unfortunately, we have not succeeded. Mm-hmm. CEG, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Elijah McCain, and many, many, many others. Um, but that's predominantly what I've been doing for the last, um, good Lord, 15 years. And you're a criminal defense lawyer on the board of directors for the ACLU as well, right? That's right, Mr. Shah. Are, are they directing you to different... Um, different events that had happened or different, you know, cases that are, you know, that have already passed and you're trying to appeal them. And what, what, what's the process there? Right. So um, as a board member of the ACLU, I'm primarily concerned with governance, but um, as a ACLU affiliate attorney, which is what I do as well, the ACLU will come to me and say, we've got a racial, this is actually currently happening right now. We've got a racial profiling case. We filed a lawsuit against the police. Will you lead this litigation? And so um, there have been times as a criminal defense lawyer where the ACLU has asked me to defend some folks who were caught up in the criminal justice system unfairly. And my law firm has a couple of criminal defense cases we're doing for them. For example, in Fort Collins, y'all might remember the police were passing these bans or the, the, the local city council was passing ordinances uh, attacking homeless people. And one way that was being enforced is certain people who were pulling over and say sleeping in their cars were being left alone. And other folks who were not, uh, who were doing the same thing were not being left alone. And so we have some litigation against um, in Fort Collins on behalf of the ACLU We also um, worked on the park ordinance case in Denver where um, the police, again, where they were trying to criminalize homelessness and the police were kicking out folks on their, they were adjudicating themselves, the police officers, whether or not you had been in the park in a previous time. 
and then just deciding without judicial intervention. Yes, I deem you to have been here illegally once before. You are now banned for life. So that's kind of the work. Uh, it really is the intersection of criminal law and civil rights law, which I believe is human rights law. One of the most meaningful changes that I have seen this year has been what I believe is America waking up to, and I don't need to tell you all, but most of America seems to have acted like we didn't have a police brutality problem or a prosecutorial uh, a problem with our prosecutors. And it feels like in 2020, things that we all knew for, the, for as long as we've been grownups, now I'm getting phone calls, oh man, Yes, I guess I, the police are out of control. <laughs> it's like, where have you been? But uh, I'm grateful for that wokeness and that awakening because uh, otherwise, I mean, this is a life and death battle. I mean, by the way, the, the struggle against the police, it's a life and death battle. I have friends who are literally afraid for their own lives when they interact with, with police officers. So, you know, so I have a, a, a question for you. In the very little I try to spend on social media, every once in a while, you'll see, and we've all seen posts like this, you'll see some posts of some brother who's getting pulled over or stopped on the side of the road and who he knows his rights and is very vocal about those rights. And luckily, the, the thing the, the videos that I've seen have honestly worked out in their favor. You know, cops usually just, yo, all right, we're backing off. OK, let's let's chill this situation out. And, and that always amazes me. See someone who uh, when you talk about knowledge is power, I'm not saying like that, maybe that doesn't work out for everybody. I don't know, but I'm just curious, how does one, and, and I'm asking for myself as well, but how does one even begin that journey of, of learning what, learning what to do in those kind of situations, knowing their rights, I, I, you know, other than like, man, I didn't do anything. I, you know, like, and, and you're just kind of at the mercy of a, a police officer or police officers. Like what can just a, a, normal person, normal citizen do, how, how can they start? Like, I, I'm just curious. Sure. Um, I think the first part of your question, which is where can, where can we go to learn how to interact properly in police civilian encounters? And I would say the ACLU, the national ACLU, as well as your state affiliate. So ACLU of New York, ACLU of California, ACLU of Colorado will have, and I know our affiliate does, has information on their website in terms of know your rights. And in fact, that's the tab for the ACLU of Colorado. Know your rights, you click on that and it, it will walk through scenarios. Um, I also uh, will reference the National Lawyers Guild, NLG. They are wonderful. Their website also will have some of the same information and they do great know your rights trainings. Black Lives Matter as well, BLM, they have really good information. But for right now, I would tell you, um, you know, uh, the first thing is to be able to ascertain when you're in a police civilian encounter is if you're free to go or not. Mm -hmm. And I will just say, if the answer is yes, you are free to go, Go, go. <laughs> <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Because it, because there's a consequence. If you don't go, the consequence is your encounter is now a consensual encounter. Mm -hmm. And consensual encounters are not what the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution uh, governs. It governs police seizures, but you are not seized if you're free to go and you're like, well, I'm just going to chit chat today with, you know, Joe Popo. Uh, no. First thing is figure out if you're free to go. And in the context of say, well, in fact, I'm doing a case right now for the ACLU, a racial profiling case where my client was doing nothing wrong, was walking to his apartment and the police stopped him, demanded his ID. And so, and that young man knew exactly what to do. It was brilliant. 
he said, why am I being detained? Am I free to go? No, you're not free to go, the police said. And they demanded his ID. And at that point, they didn't have a reasonable basis to demand identification. So our client, rightfully, he had his camera on, just like uh, Mr. Evans was referencing the smart people that, that do record these things. And he said, I'm not giving you my permission to search me or take my ID, but I'm not going to fight you either. Right. I mean, you know, that's a big, big part of it. I've read some cases. Uh, those these are blood draw cases where the police believed somebody was under the influence and the suspect didn't want to consent. The best thing you can do to protect your rights later in court, if that's where this goes, which Frankly, if you're calling me for the most part, you're in trouble, right? Something happened, you've been charged or you've been beaten up or, but our client said, um, you don't have my permission, you don't have my consent, but I'm not gonna fight you. So that kept the, the temperature of the interaction way down. Police understood, all right, this guy isn't being threatening, but he's not acquiescing or cooperating. So they, the police still had something to complain about, of course, because unless you obey like a, you know, like somebody without free will or an independent opinion, police are going to find you objectionable. That's right. the nature of police and fascist, fascistic psychology. Mm -hmm. But um, so first determine if you're free to go. Am I free to go? If you're in a, uh, if you've been pulled over and you're the one driving, most of us have enough common sense to know, no, you're not usually free to go until you provide some, your ID, insurance, registration. Um, all of that presumes, you know, the police are contacting you legally. The best thing you can do, am I free to go? And when they say no, you can voice your objection and your lack of consent, but just, I want people to be safe in their encounters with police. I want them going home to their families. So it is very important to me that people understand you can protect yourself and keep the temperature down. Right. That's easy to say sitting in a, in a suit in my house, because when you're in the situation and I have been cuffed by the police wrongfully and I didn't sound like this, it sounded more like, you know, because yeah. I was angry. Emotions were um, elevated. They get the better of you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so, but that's really it. I mean, uh, those are the three resources, ACLU, BLM, NLG, National Lawyers Guild, will have great resources. First thing though is always figure out, can I go or not? If the answer is yes, get on with your bad self, right? Yeah, <laughs> there you go, wow. Uh, do you think that, you know, a lot of people talk about there being two different criminal justice systems, you know, and a lot of people accept that idea and a lot of people don't accept that idea. And I feel like it's a very real thing that's happening, but I feel like some people don't really hear the day-to-day -day examples, you know, of the clear racial bias. Do you have any examples of, you know, different, um, things that you've encountered um, professionally that shows that there isn't, you know, a real disparity between, you know, people of color and, you know, white America? That's a great question. It's an insightful question. And you're right. There are people who are out there denying the disparity in, if not intent, in impact for people of color. You know, so the way I'll answer that is, it's a complicated question. Are there two systems? Because everybody, no matter what side you're on, only sees one system. It's the justice system, whether you're in state court, municipal court, or federal court. It's still one system and there don't appear to be different rules. You know, the Colorado rules of criminal procedure or civil procedure are colorblind. The federal rules are colorblind. The statutes, which statutes are the laws that govern conduct are also colorblind. They're race neutral. So the folks who say, well, there's not two systems. These are the types of things they point to. We, but it's the choices that are made that show the discriminatory effect. And I think intent. So to answer the question, one has to understand 
all prosecution, all 100% of prosecutions are a political choice. The choice to punish crack cocaine in the federal system, which was a problem, far more severely than punishing the possession of cocaine, that's a political choice. Mm. White people do cocaine, black people do crack cocaine. So the choice to punish one more harshly was a political choice. That's one that has now at least gotten enough attention um, that that's changed. Do you find that sometimes the uh, public prosecutors, you know, and I've been in situations where I've kind of seen it happen in courtrooms where almost everyone takes the plea deal that's given to them, you know, by the you know public prosecutor, uh, uh, public defender and the, the judge. And is it what's best for the client always? Or, you know, is it because the fight is sometimes going to be too much to take on in general? You know, I know your, your, your uh, duties to the client and not to society, but the client probably still ends up with something on their record or, you know, ends up in the system, you know? And, and I, I've, I remember being in a courtroom and just seeing everybody taking deals and everyone that I spoke to before that had said that they had either not done it or explained to me the situation of how they got there. And they all took probably the worst possible plea deals. And I remember, you know, I had pled not guilty and I had fought it, but it took a lot. And it took a lot, many years and money. And it was, you know, for something that was a, a, a felony for a, a gram of marijuana in Arizona, you know? So it's, it, you see, when you see it happen in real life, it's just, you wonder if it's, the system itself is just broken even within the courts. Well, yes. The predominant way that plays out is with the way bail and bond works. I would see when, and I was lucky to be able to start my career as a public defender in the state of Colorado. It's the best public defender system in the country. Dedicated, dedicated, smart, passionate, hardworking, and tireless advocates. No matter how much work those public defenders had, as far as my experience was, is that they were always ready, willing, and able to bring that fight. Um, but to what you're talking about, the system harms the folks caught up in it. There's no question. And one of the ways that surfaces is in coerced plea deals that coercion, by the way, all of us would understand coercion, but this, the justice system has its own very specific definition of coercion, which then, so it's only coercion if there's practically a gun to your head. Mm. What And where I have seen what you just described, uh, Mr. Shah, play out is in situations where someone is arrested, say, um, on Friday, they, they've been in jail all weekend, they need to get to work. And, and this is actually a, an easy example. They need to get to work. And I'm saying, well, your bail is $10,000. You need a thousand, a little more than a thousand to get out. And if you don't, you're going to have to sit here until your trial. Or the prosecutor is offering you plead guilty today, get on probation. And guess what, Mr. Defendant, you go home today. Mm. A lot of my, yeah. And, you know, to whom is that not coercion? That's total coercion. Basically, I don't want to plead guilty. I'm innocent, but I can't bail out and I got to get back to work. So folks do plead guilty. That is coercion. And so you got to reform bail. I mean, you cannot reform a justice system without eradicating money bail. Um, and again, speaking of, of money and, you know, this this implies certainly a high level of uh, collusion to use a hot button word from the last uh, four years or so. Uh, but do you think that there's incentive from, you know, we know that there's privatized for profit prisons now that have very lucrative businesses that they're getting on nearly free labor for. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think. You know, I wonder, have you seen evidence of or do you think that that informs the way that the uh, 
criminal justice system works in the actual courtrooms and then beyond that how police are told to act on the streets is it like this three-part sort of connected string of things that are all under some grand direction or do you think they each have their own isolated issues that somehow feed the same problem really insightful question i don't believe that there's a connected sort of conspiracy being directed by that's just not possible. There's too many people involved and they don't stay involved forever. So too many moving parts for there to be that level of cooperation and collusion, not to mention how would that, how would the direction be communicated without discovery? No, I don't believe that is what we're talking about. What we're instead talking about is, is autonomous components of government operating Um, in harmony to some extent to protect each other. Police are protected by the courts because you hear it. Judges say things like, well, I don't believe we have a system of policing where they're going around and and, and arresting everybody who didn't do anything wrong. That judges believe that. And so it's hard to combat people who have a presumptive who have presumptive faith in police, right? And so police then act, or judges then act to protect themselves. I mean, it's, it's basically institutional players acting to protect themselves and the institutions that protect them. I will say things are getting better in Colorado. We passed a police accountability bill last summer that I believe should be an example for the rest of the country. I believe we were probably the first to do do that um we removed a particular type of immunity from police so police could kill you and be like well i didn't know killing that dude in that way was going to be illegal now remember from your own common sense ignorance of the law is not a defense you remember that but it is a defense for police officers literally they get to say in federal court i didn't know that was illegal And up until, you know, up until this summer in Colorado, and it's still the law in federal court, federal judges would say whether that was objectively reasonable or not. And if it was objectively reasonable that the cop didn't know the law, which is is bizarre, then they get a pass. So ignorance of the law is no defense unless you're a cop. The way we're going to solve these problems are, one, uh, supporting our community leaders. So, um, you know, Black Lives Matter is already out there. The ACLU is already out there. National Lawyer Guild, already out there. What is harmful is when a hundred other people say, well, I'm gonna start a hundred other organizations and dilute this, dilute the power of the people. I mean, I fully recognize not being a joiner. I have that gene in me, but um, joining groups that are already in the fight and have relationships. So with ACLU, by joining the ACLU, for example, you're funding and supporting our ED, the executive director, meeting with the mayor, the chief of police, going to the town of Aurora. So, and that's partially how we got police accountability in Colorado. So when I see ACLU victories, I think, well, what is the outcome for the people of Colorado? And the outcome has been increased accountability, better jails. Um, of course, you've heard me brag about our public defender system. Um, that's not necessarily connected to the strength of our ACLU affiliate, but uh, I don't think it's wholly unrelated, which is a concern for civil rights and human rights for the Coloradans, which is what our primary focus is. Um, but I wanted to say that I think it's important that folks support local organizations doing this work, $10, $5, $15, whatever, rather than starting splinter organizations, which does happen when things like summers, like what we're having right now, which I think is a new civil rights movement. Um, It can be easy to say, well, I'll start my own organization. Sure, but it's probably better for you to join someone else's because they've already got the relationships. They've already got the conversations they're already working on legislation. You, Man, you know, it's, it's, it's really interesting. I just had this conversation with a, a really good friend of mine, and we were talking about, we were trying not to go down a negative road, but we're saying how uh, we have friends all over the country 
who are protesting and, and, and seemingly doing the right thing. But what I what I noticed is like, man, it almost got it's almost gotten to a point this summer, especially that there's all like you said, all like these little organizations popping up. Everybody's trying to do the right thing, but there's no real leadership, I guess, you know, like, and again, there are organizations out there that have been around for a long time. And sometimes I feel that that's kind of the problem in a way, like people just say, oh, that's this old school. I'm, I'm going to jump on this new thing when in fact they should be like aligning with, you know, these people who have been around the block many times. But I said, man, you know, it's so funny. Look at this, man. Like all there's these all these organizations, all these people protesting and no, and, but the right wing, man, they, they're united. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's, that's what it looks like. You know what I'm saying, man? And I, I was just saying, I really wish people uh, were on the left, really trying to fight the good fight would actually, that's what I think that's the one thing that I've noticed. Everyone's talking about the civil rights uh, uh, movement of the sixties. And that's and 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 comparing and making comparisons. That's the one difference for me is just a, a lack of real unity. I'm I'm glad people are out there. It's beautiful to see people out, you know, like making their voices heard. But that's the the one thing, man. And I'm gl- I'm glad you you mentioned that. You know, it's like we there there are organizations who have been around for a long time who know how to fight this. You know, and who know the fight. And 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 uh, so it, it would be really great if everyone watching, if they're thinking or if they're already out, like out there doing it, it's, it's beautiful. But there's there's nothing wrong with like getting up with uh, with people who really know what they're doing. You know, like we you know. So anyway, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that, man, because that, that's uh, that's been something that's been uh, I've been uh, struggling with, you know, so I appreciate that. Well, uh, uh, yeah, of course, that is a struggle. It, it's something that I'm, I was a Bernie supporter. Um, mm-hmm. Maybe some of you were too. Um, yeah. And Joe Biden is not Bernie Sanders by a long shot. But you know what? Joe Biden is better than Donald Trump, and those are my choices. So yeah. a lot of folks forget that we don't live in a world where you're going to get the perfect candidate. That's just not the world we live in. I don't know that world. I've never seen that world. And I don't believe that world exists. And Voltaire had a quote that I find useful in a lot of scenarios, which is, do not let perfection be the enemy of good. And sometimes you can have something that's good and folks like, well, it's not perfect. So fuck that, you know, and I've had friends even who are like, yeah, you know what? Let's just burn it all down. Let Trump win and burn it up. But people are going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. easy to say that if you don't have all that much on the line. I find a lot of people whose lives didn't change that much from, you know, Obama to Trump. It, they're at the forefront, um, splintering the left in half. And they don't really have that much on the line, or so they think. I mean, who knows what another four years of this might look like not to get too partisan here. Cause we're trying to discuss general issues and facts, but, right, right, right. but yeah, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit of a generational thing too, where, and I was a little bit guilty of it last time with the Bernie thing, feeling like he got, he got burned. And uh, you know, this, this animosity that made me almost, of course I went out and I voted for Hillary, but I almost thought about it. People did not Yeah. Right. I thought about not doing it. And I think we are used to immediate gratification. We're used to getting everything we want. It's all at our fingertips. We've got our phone. we got social media. We're not used to the idea of settling for anything as a generation. I am super guilty of this as well. So that I think that's part of it, too. People don't understand. Like, this has always been the way it's been. You have, unfortunately, a binary choice. And maybe one day that'll change. But it hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I mean, voting is not a marriage. You're not married to this candidate. It's just a, you know, like it's a, it's like a bus ride. You take the bus to where this guy's going to take you. You, you take, you stop at that stop, and then you find the next candidate that's going to take you even closer to where you're trying to go. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I like that. <laughs> thank you guys so much again with all of these. I feel like we could we could go on forever. So much to ask you, and maybe we'll do it again. But this has been really informative. I think we covered some really, really good points. 
Um, so Basil, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Great to see you all on here. Great to meet you. And uh, again, it's just, I've been fanboying uh, for the last few days uh, in preparation for this. So thanks again. I appreciate uh, it. Same here. All same right. Here. Have a great day. Yeah. Yeah. You too, man. Later. Bye.